Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of UCalgary's Community Webinar Series. Today, we're discussing the impacts of the pandemic on athletics. I'm Deborah Gedlin, and I'll be your moderator today. Welcome back to all of you who've attended any of our previous webinars, and to all our new viewers, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we're recording this webinar on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Pakani, and Kenai First Nations, as well as the Tsutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And we started this webinar series at the onset of the pandemic with an aim to inform and support our community members by connecting them with COVID-related research and resources. More than a year later, we've expanded our focus to include a wider variety of topics, but our purpose has remained the same, to share and discuss knowledge and insight from our guests and you Calgary experts with the community. Together, we can use research and facts and science to find solutions and take on the challenges we face. After today, we are pausing our community webinar series until September, when we will return with more conversations about topics that matter to all of us. As we know, combating the spread of COVID-19 meant a significant disruption to our daily routines. But how did this disruption affect athletes in particular, whose performance is so reliant on regular training schedules, team practice, access to facilities and coaches, and we know that it was quite a challenge for everyone. Now as varsity sports prepare for a new season and the world awaits the return of international competition with the Olympics starting in July, athletes will soon be back in the spotlight where the physical and mental effects of the pandemic will be made apparent. Have months of isolation taken a toll or will the mental resilience gained throughout the pandemic push athletes to new heights? We're so proud of our own new Calgary athletes. The incredible talent on our Dinos teams puts New Calgary at the top of the athletic tier in the country, and they couldn't do it without support from the community. From the diehard fans who cheer the, from the bleachers at every game and freeze during football games in the fall, to the philanthropic support that helps them in their pursuit of excellence. This support comes from people like Michelle, Michael and Jane Welch, who have given more than $80,000 towards the cross country and track and field program. The Six Man Club, which donated $150,000 to the UC Dinos men's basketball program, and the Dinos football alumni fifth quarter group that has also raised very much, many dollars for the Dinos athletics. UCalgary is the top sports science school in North America. The Faculty of Kinesiology is improving the health and, and mobility for all ages and abilities from youth to older individuals and from recreational participants to elite, elite athletes and Olympians. Everyone's included in our research. And again, our community plays an important role in driving that impact. The University of Calgary was the only Canadian institution to receive funding from the National Football League's Scientific Advisory Board to reduce concussions and their consequences in youth sport on a national level are felt in every sport. And UCalgary's, UCalgary's Alberta Cancer Exercise Program, which is a free 12-week exercise program intended to help improve outcomes for those with cancer, undergoing cancer treatments, received $2.5 million in research funding from a Canadian Cancer Society, Canadian Institutes of Health, Health Research Cancer Survivorship Team Grant in partnership with the Alberta Cancer Foundation. Has had, this program has had tremendous results. So to talk about all these, all these topics and touch on everything, and I'm sure we'll run out of time, I'm delighted to be joined today by three guests who bring with them diverse experience in athletics, and two of the guests are former members of our Olympic teams. I'd first like to welcome Dr. Penny Werthner, Dean of the Faculty of Kinesiology. She's one of the country's most distinguished consultants in the field of sports psychology and has worked with Canada's national and Olympic teams since 1985. She's one of the founding members of the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women and Sport and Physical Activity and was named one of the most, the top most influential women in sport. She was a member of Canada's national track and field team and went to the Olympics in 1976 and was named to the team in 1980. Uh, of course, we boycotted that year but, and did not go to the Olympics, but her distance was the 1500 meters. Also joining us is UCalgary alumna Kellyanne Erdman. 
Kellyanne, Kellyanne is a registered dietitian specializing in sport. She practices at the University of Calgary Sports Medicine Center with clients from the general public, including high school performance and professional athletes. She's the lead dietitian with Hockey Canada, Speed Skating Canada, and Luge Canada. Kelly has, Kellyanne has also been working with the men's dino basketball team for the past five years, and she just said she's going to be seeing them next week for the first time since March of 2020 in person. She is also a special instructor in kinesiology and was a member of the 1992 Olympic Canada's Olympic team as a cyclist. Finally, I'd like to welcome you Calgary alumna, alumni Max Eisel. Max played for five years with the Dinos men's basketball team, which means he was part of that championship team uh, while completing both his bachelor's and master's degrees with a major in health and exercise physiology and in kinesiology. His master's thesis, which he just completed, studied the online delivery of exercise for cancer survivors supported with health, health coaching. So welcome all of you and thank you for being here. Now, I just wanna remind everyone who's online that um, you can submit questions or comments at any time throughout our discussion by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and we will get to as many questions as time allows. So my first question before we see people start to weigh in is how do athletes put themselves back in a sport mindset after such an interruption in their training, in their ability to collaborate with their fellow teammates and in distant circumstances? So I'm going to start with Penny. I'm going to go to Max and I'll finish with Kellyanne. Well, I don't think it's going to be easy. That's for sure. I think if I think first of our varsity athletes, you know, they've missed a whole season. Um, and so it won't be easy coming back, except that I know they're all very eager to come back and get back into the, the gym and on the fields. And so, um, but they're going to have missed a year of, of serious training. You know, we've sort of been on and off training as allowed by the, by the province over this last year, but it'll make for an interesting season for sure, because athletes, um, you know, feed off competition and start to understand themselves more as they compete and play games. And they're going to have missed a whole season of that. So that will be that it, it won't be easy. I think all athletes have struggled and, um, you know, our Olympic athletes um, missed a whole season as well. So it's going to be a very different games from, I mean, in many different ways, but certainly that in, in, um, in, in thinking of, you know, not having competed for a year. And a lot of our athletes now have had a number of competitions. So they're back sort of into, into that mode of competing and, and others haven't. Um, so it, I think this year has been a struggle uh, for everyone, but I think most of our athletes, I think our varsity athletes have had great support from our coaches um, at the varsity level. And I think most of our Olympic athletes have had great support um, from their coaches and their support staff and, and family that's helped them get through this unprecedented uh, adversity. I mean, we use that term, but I think it really is the best term. I mean, when have we ever seen something like this before? But I think it's been tough for everybody, but I think everyone's eager to get back. So looking forward to it for sure. Spectators and athletes. Uh, yeah. Max, over to you. Yeah, I can definitely echo here Penny's last point that the coaching staff has been amazing um, around supporting, at least for my side, the basketball team. And yeah, really being there for them in any, any step of the way. I think the eagerness is a, is a big factor. And I think that's where we have to be a little bit careful with coming back to sports is also because of injury risks. Um, just because we haven't had these impacts, especially like with basketball, jumping, running on the court for 40 minutes. Um, it is just something different than working out in your basement. And um, even though we are all emotionally pretty eager to get out there, I think that is something uh, big to consider is to gradually make your way back into it um, to prevent having bad injuries then if you go too fast. Yeah, no, that's uh, it, it's one thing, like you said, to be in your basement or wherever you've been training. And it's another thing to be on a court and uh, using your body a bit more dynamically. Kellyanne. Yeah, just to uh, feed off of uh, what Max is saying as the dietitian, um, you know, the progression and everyone's going to come in at a different level of fitness. Some have had the motivation to keep up 
um, it's of course, many of our varsity teams are team sports and these athletes, um, they train, but they're not necessarily in individual sports like track and field where there's a, been a different level of motivation to keep going. And especially if, if um, a, a lot of their time with activity is, is working with others. So we really do need to do some careful testing as to the fitness level. And as Max has said, to prevent injury, of course, um, everyone's expenditure. I mean, let's face it, 99.9% .9 of people in the last 12 months, their expenditure is down just because you're not parking in the parking lot and walking into the office. You're going up or down the stairs or maybe living on one level. So the daily energy expenditure, the training energy expenditure, the motivation to work hard. So as a result, we're typically seeing some weight gain with people and not necessarily putting on muscle in that weight gain. So that might be something that we need to deal with up front is uh, adjusting body composition uh, in a careful way to support good energy to train. Um, we know that alcohol intake has been up across the country and I think athletes are not immune to that. So uh, that's another consideration on the, maybe the calorie piece, but, uh, but let's take a sensible approach and yes, we're all gung ho, but let's not have an injury in a month's time into sport. And now we're further set back. Right. So it's, it's time to, to be smart, to train smart and to listen to your body and, and that slow progression. And we are probably going to have a shorter season from what I understand, Dr. Werthner with uh, the varsity teams, uh, fewer games. It's not going to be a full on year. So there, there will be a, a slower introduction, getting back at it. But, uh, you know, other things, uh, Deborah looking at immune system, how strong is our system? We're getting back together and hopefully vaccinated and uh, we need a strong immunity to, to keep the battle going and to stay healthy as well. And you know, those would be some of the issues. So I actually, you mentioned something and it was a question that I had um, and I, it's for all of you, but I think uh, we'll start with Max and go to, to Penny, but there's a difference between the team sports, how, how athletes who are members of teams have dealt with this versus athletes who are individual athletes. You know, whether you're, you're like Kellyanne, you're a cyclist, you can go out, you can get on your trainer, you can do stuff on your own. It's a bit different in terms of how you keep yourself motivated versus how the teams, the team um, uh, oriented athletes are. So I'm just curious as to uh, what the difference is in the mindset of both and what needs to happen for both kind of athlete to get ready, to get competition ready. So I'll start with you, Max, to go to uh, Patty and then Kellyanne. Yeah, that is a good question. I think I can only speak mainly from the team side. And I think for right. team sports, it is quite hard um, to stay motivated. I think you have to have quite a good schedule where you basically do your things every day. And we have a great strength and conditioning coach with Rich Hesketh, who um, had us on Zoom calls three to sometimes four times a week, um, doing the exercises to at least stay in shape for um, the upcoming season then. But on the basketball side, is it's it's harder. You can go out to a street ball court, but you couldn't do that during the winter. Um, and <laughs> to <laughs> drive your roommates crazy with some dribbling exercises <laughs> in the basement. But um, yeah, that's that's about the extent of it. And it, I think, another big component is also just that mental piece where you yeah. you miss your best friends and <laughs> you're not really spending time with them like you used to and. Um, during the season you sometimes maybe get a little bit annoyed of them because they're literally there 24-7 um, but then all of a sudden that cut comes and you just have no more contact with them unless like you're facetiming them and yeah but it's not that team environment where you're sitting in the locker room and chatting around and having a good time um, so I think that's another huge consideration of um, how it may be different in a team sport compared to an individual sport to like stay with the head as well in the game. Yeah. Um, Penny, you're, you're, you were, an, you're, you know, you, you were a runner, so you were on the individual side and, and also Kelly Amps. I'm just curious as to how you see, you know, how the differences uh, affect the athletes of different kinds. Well, well, I think there is a difference and yet in some ways I don't think it's as huge a difference as we sometimes think when I think of 
Um, if I think of varsity, well, even varsity sport or Olympic level, um, for sure in team sports, you have one goal. And so it brings everyone together in a, in a very specific way. And Max, just as you said, when we, we weren't able to compete and it suddenly stops. I mean, that was a massive piece, I think, for all our varsity athletes and, and for our Olympic athletes. At the same time in the individual sports, cycling, diving, even track, which is, a, it, which is you know, many, many different events, those athletes in their training groups are still together quite a bit, even when they compete against each other in the same event, like the 100 or the 1500 or whatever distance it might be. And so there is still a team piece now, and that has been, you know, the case for many years. So I think, um, you know, depending on the province, when athletes were really not allowed to train at all, that was, you know, they didn't see anyone at all. It, it was quite a struggle for many and then in other provinces where they were still able to come into a venue and train socially distance etc they still got a little bit of that so you know our athletes struggle differently across Canada um, I think depending on the context and then of course for some of our athletes that have been in the U.S. Uh, training um, and whether that's at the varsity level or or at the Olympic level you know some things changed and some things didn't change um, as well, we know. Um, luckily, most of them didn't get COVID. So that was good, despite what was going on in the US. But I, I think it, it is different, but it isn't, it isn't different in lots of different ways. And I think that has been one of, I mean, Kellyanne, you talked about all the sort of physiological pieces that are so critical to coming back now um, for our varsity athletes and how we need to be careful about that. And, and then psychologically, <clears throat> our athletes have missed each other. So um, it'll, be, it'll be great to have, um, you know, all our varsity sports playing again, even in a shorter season. It will be so nice to have it all happening. Yeah. Kellyanne. Yeah, I think with, um, with this last year and everything so unpredictable, and we spoke about it as, you know, win the weight, and how the finish line kept moving. And for some athletes, it was uh, to the point where they just said, well, to heck with this. And, you know, there's the mental health piece and that leads to the emotional eating piece. So that's definitely one of the challenges that uh, some people were up against. We saw an increased number of disordered eating scenarios, frank eating disorders, weight gain, weight loss. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just, affected people's normal balance of, um, I know how to eat when I'm training, but take away that expenditure. And it's like this 15 month injury that kept going, even though you weren't injured and just being, you know, removed from in, in many cases. But um, so that, that was a, definitely a big part of it and in, in, uh, in this recovery, but yeah, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see. You know, one thing to keep in mind too is how it's, this has affected people's future because yeah. many of our, our team athletes go from varsity teams to professional teams yeah. and sport in life is such a short lifespan of years that you have to compete at the elite level, whether it's Olympics, whether it's varsity teams. And so many of these oh. athletes have missed the opportunity to shine and be recruited and be seen. And, yeah. and that, you know, leads to other, uh, implications and affecting nutritional choices and and lifestyle and it's just it really demonstrated to us what a, a tight system that we had with all these parts that were just in sync like a clock and it's been disrupted so much of the identity is tied up in what you're doing as an athlete because yeah. that's how you identify on a, on a regular basis but you look at our football players trying to make the cfl and our basketball and volleyball players trying to make professional teams and yeah it's it's really been but, but it, deb if i can just enter you know yeah. it's interesting to think about that identity and and for sure i'm sure max you you identified as much as a basketball player, as a, as a student, um, and maybe that's shifting a little bit now, and that's what, what happens. But I, one of the things we've done, it just completed a piece of research on how our Olympic athletes have, have dealt with COVID. And 
one of the things, and Kellyanne, you just made me think of it, is they've, you know, with the help of someone, and in many cases, it was their coach. Um, sometimes it was, you know, someone else in their support team, but it was often their coach helped them start to think about multiple identities so that they, you know, they're not just an athlete. So some that, that have done well, well, they've all struggled for sure, but that have have managed through this, you know, went back to school, started taking courses, um, started thinking about who else they could be other than an athlete. And I, and then with the support of their coach, um, I think it will actually bode well for competing this year as a result of that. So it's not to say, I mean, it's been unprecedented, but, you know, a lot of athletes have struggled in a good way through it. And I, I think some of them will come out better for it. And it will help with that inevitable transition out of, of being just an athlete into, you know, a new life, a new career. So there's a, there's a question that's coming on the chat. Um, uh, are there athletes that could have benefited from the downtime? Just such as having the extended time to recover and heal from injuries. And so could you end up seeing actually a more competitive season with all the athletes, you know, competing in whatever fields they're, they're competing in than normally would have happened. I just, you know, when you talk about, you know, some of us who watch tennis, right. There's no break in tennis anymore. There's a tournament from January to December. It used not to be like that. There were far fewer tournaments, but now you see the injuries in tennis and the challenge that the professional athletes have to recover. So Curious as to whether this hiatus has actually benefited the athletes in some way because they do have time to recover. Well, I think it's I think it's benefited some athletes who definitely had injuries and were able to to have that time to repair from those injuries. And also a couple of our athletes at the Olympic level who uh, women athletes who had babies and it's given them another oh. year to be ready for the Olympics. So. There, there, yeah, there, there absolutely have been some positives on that, I think. Max, I mean, you have, what about your fellow competitors, I'm, you know, and your teammates? I'm sure you've heard them say, well, this, you know, I had this, I was actually able to rehab it properly instead of having to rush back. Have you heard those stories? Yeah, I think there's definitely some truth to that. I think, like, for example, one good example in our team is Azua Santiago. He tore his ACL in our last game um, that we actually were able to play. And he had quite a bit of time now to recover. And it's probably better, especially with ACL injuries, because we often do rush players back into um, competition. And then um, that's when another tear happens. Mm -hmm. So I do think it was beneficial in that way. However, I think there's also the downside of not having the accessibility to rehab or his surgery was delayed quite a bit. And having all of the facilities that you normally would have not... Mm -hmm open or not as accessible mm -hmm. as normal so i do oh, think yeah, yeah. sorry <laughs> no no go ahead i think one last point would just be it also comes down then even more on the personal responsibility and um how much you then do uh, work into that injury that you have by yourself because you don't have that support as much um, by other institutions for example a physiotherapist where you just have to sit down yourself in your room and do the rehab exercises. Yeah, yeah. you have to you have to be self motivated to to, to follow through. Yeah. Kellyanne, I'm sure you've seen a bunch uh, athletes injured and um, sort of seen that both sides of the coin. Well, I work in the sport medicine center, and we've been fortunate to haven't missed a beat. We've kept open the whole time through, so we've had uh, some um, opportunity. Our elective surgeries, of course, have been. Uh, at some point curtailed. But um, I just wanted to get back to what D Dr. Werther was saying too around the, you know, the positives. And I work with our men's para hockey team. We just won silver at the world championships on Sunday. And this pandemic, well, we're going for gold. Uh, we beat the US in preliminaries, but they kicked our butt in the gold, gold medal, but that's okay because this, uh, the pandemic, what amazing team bonding. The WhatsApp, like also, I mean, I'm not sure about you guys, but the IT that I've learned in the last 12 months has been <laughs> crazy. If I can just remember all my passwords, but whichever, it's uh, been a bit not so, but uh, just being innovative and learning ways to communicate and cooking out of my kitchen upstairs with uh, athletes across the country. Our Paris, we had about three different cooking sessions live. Um, 
uh, may or may not have had a glass of wine with that, not saying, but uh, it was a lot of fun and just some great team building and communication that brought the team together, which is already a decentralized team coast to coast, but the pandemic, wow, what a team bonding exercise. And so even though, again, got the silver, we're focused on Beijing and, and going for gold. So a um, couple of interesting questions have come in on the chat. One is from Rod McKay, and he wants to know what the Calgary community can do to help the athletes uh, come back, so to speak, in addition to what the athletes or the university community is already doing. Is there something we can do in the city that shows our support for our athletes? Who wants to take that? Well, I think one thing would be to come out to the games. That would be fantastic. Um, it would be so good for our athletes, for our community. And so I'm sure we're looking in dinos at ways to get the community to come out and, and um, you know, engage with our basket and volleyball teams and soccer and rugby and when football. the football season starts. So that would be one way for sure. Yeah. Come out and support. Absolutely. I think the, the dinos, uh, the football, uh, football season starts, if I'm not mistaken, the 25th of September. Yep. So hopefully it's a nice yep. day and we can get everybody out in the community. So that's, yeah. uh, that's really good, good advice. And another question from Ian Minifee, who's of course involved with the fifth quarter, we know, um, and so active in supporting our athletes. Uh, and he's, you know, he says, it sounds like there was good support for our athletes given the situation, but who was supporting our coaches? How are the coaches coping with the challenges that they had with their teams and their athletes, um, you know, having to deal with the, their, 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 their athletes uh, differently than they've been used to? And what challenges did that pose, do you think? Well, I'll make a quick comment and then maybe turn it, turn it to Max, but I, I think the coaches have struggled as well. I think it's a great question, Ian, and um, we often forget our coaches, I think, to their to our detriment, because I, I think they're a critical, critical piece in performance with our athletes. Um, but I, I, they've absolutely struggled because they're they're frustrated. They would like to have been training and playing all last year. Um, and and we were a bit off and on. Right. Things open, things close, things same as for the restaurant owners, et cetera. It's been a. It's been a tough year for many, many folks, the university itself. So, um, you know, I mean, we've, we've still been having meetings. The coaches have still had meetings, et cetera. Um, I mean, we've still been getting together, but I think they'll be super happy to see their athletes in a much more consistent way. Sure. Yeah. Max, did you, what kind of conversations did you have with your coaches about how they were coping? Yeah, I do think it was quite the struggle, especially because there that meaning kind of falls away because a lot of the interactions are just you're in the gym working um, players out or you're having conversations with people in the office and all of these things just falling away, constantly being at home. And I guess for our head coach also being more exposed to his family and um, which I think was a little bit of a blessing for him, actually. Um, but then for example, our, <laughs> our assistant coach, um, they, they did design their time. Well, I think like our assistant coach, for example, started something it's called SPSS and he just basically made a huge database of videos and, um, tried to teach us that way and became inventive and same with our strength and conditioning coach. I think they had a little bit of fun with it, which, which is something good. So, yeah, but I don't know how much support from the outside they really received other than mm -hmm. our gratitude. Um, but yeah, I think that's the extent of it. Um, I just, I'd like to just t go back and touch on something that Kellyanne mentioned about the eating disorders. And that's something that I have also seen in the press. We've seen it affecting uh, athletes because they haven't been able to train. And so I'm, I'm just curious if you can talk a bit more about that and, um, some of the uh, steps that are being taken to support these the athletes so they get back to a better a place of balance when it comes to their nutrition and self um, their you know their, their their image of themselves. Right. Yeah, Deborah. In terms of you know disordered eating and in eating issues, it's it's just a, another way of coping to a, an additional layer of stress that's put onto these individuals and you know adding to it the lack of access to fitness. And uh, I mean, sure, it's great in the spring and summer, but when we were in the bitter cold of winter and people in 
some environments having literally no fitness equipment and can only do so many, you know, uh, jumping jacks, not that we want them to be excessively exercising, but just not having that outlet that exercise provides, um, you know, and, and where we see more binge eating scenarios, um, maybe some anorexia, but uh, more just um, everything just seems so chaotic and out of control that one thing people try to control is their nutrition and, and that can backfire if you are suffering from issues with that as well. So it's, it, it, it's about learning the balance and, um, and listening to your body and, and looking at understanding that nutrition is nourishment and the nutrients that we need to stay healthy and, and to figure out the mindfulness of eating and intuitive eating, listening to our body's needs and adjusting accordingly without uh, all those emotional layers to it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things too, is that that self, that feedback loop that we talk about, you know, the exercise the that sort of lends itself to better eating habits and of course, better mental health. And I'm just curious as to whether we can go in the direction of talking about the importance of exercise and mental health. And, you know, when you're an athlete, you rely on that so much. And then all of a sudden it's taken away from you in terms of the rigor that you've, you've been accustomed to. And so what, you know, from a mental health perspective, is there anything that you or Penny or Max can talk about in terms of how the athletes were affected in the last 60 months? Well, I guess there's a number of different ways to think about it. If we, if we think about competitive athletes um, or varsity or Olympic level, um, the exercise is part of who they are and what they do, that they, they train every day. And the, the mental health is often, or the mental illness issues are often more around the stress related to competition and whether they get injured, whether they get deselected from a team, whether they, um, and then the games are canceled. And I know a lot of athletes when, when the Canadian Olympic committee, um, said we weren't going to Tokyo in 2020, a lot of athletes were shocked by that and really scared because at that very point in time, they thought, we weren't going to go, Canada wasn't going to go, but the rest of the world was going to go. And so they felt a lot better the next week when the IOC finally came out and said, okay, the games are going to be postponed. So I, I think the mental stress um, around this whole COVID piece has been substantial. Um, and again, I would say for those, what, what we know, one of the ways we know that helps manage it for competitive athletes is is a support system. And that can look a variety of different ways. Certainly it is a coach. Sometimes it's a sports psychologist. Sometimes it's someone else on the sports science team. And sometimes it's their family or their, or their partner, but it's a critical component to managing the adversity. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, but then if we leave sort of competitive sport and talk about it from, um, you know, the, 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 the stress, the mental stress that our students have felt this last year, um, especially our first year students doing Zoom, doing this all day long, if they took five courses, I mean, that, that was immense. And, and that's where I might say, you know, that's where exercise then can play such a critically important role in helping manage that stress um, so that you get outside, do something. I mean, it doesn't have to be competitive, but some kind of, of movement preferably outside, maybe not when it's minus 30, unless you're a real keen skier, but, um, and that's a piece we, we need to help our students do a better job of, I think. Um, so it, it kind of depends on how, how you, um, how you, you know, what kind of, what person we're talking about and the amount of exer exercise or training that they're doing and how mental health plays into that. But I think that for sure, the stress has been, um, obviously, um, you know, re-COVID and what was going to happen and where, whether, because there's Olympic qualifications for most teams and they got canceled or they were postponed. I mean, the, the uncertainty that went on this last year for everyone, right? Not, I mean, it's sort of, that was my example Olympics, but it was the same, Max, for all our varsity teams and Kellyanne for every you know, nobody knew what was going to happen the next day, let alone the next week. And that was pretty stressful for sure for all of us, I think. 
So we've heard we've heard a lot of people talking about mental health generally in the last 16 months. It's something that we are continuing to work in, towards in terms of decreasing stigma. So Max, I'm wondering what kind of conversations you had with your teammates. Yeah, um, I do think like the biggest one is that outlet. Like normally with school and all the other stressors that are going on in our lives, uh, sport is just always that outlet of energy and also just like not thinking about anything else that's going on but just enjoying the sport that you love and doing that um i think that is a big factor i think another huge factor that we had lots of conversations about around jet around november october is when we still weren't certain if there was going to be a youth sports season mm -hmm. because we constantly practiced in a way where we didn't know if we are actually practicing for a competition or if we're just practicing and continuously doing the same thing for not really an end goal and that was a, a pretty hard time for most of us uh, to stay motivated, to also enjoy the sport. And um, yeah, so those, those were the main conversations that we had. I think around that time, it was really, really hard. And then once we knew there wasn't going to be a season, um, it was just about, again, <laughs> trying to continue to exercise and to continue to stay with the team, even though we know we didn't have a competition for another year and a bit and um yeah just just staying with the team there so from a mental health and wellness standpoint what else did you and your teammates do if you didn't have that other outlet of basketball practices at set and games what did you do yeah i think i think one of the big ones for us was just like doing facetimes chatting with each other and um being pretty open with sharing each other's frustrations or mm. yeah fears um, I think our coaching staff was always really good with that, with just being accessible if somebody was struggling. Um, and then, yeah, once we were allowed to meet in small groups, <laughs> play spike ball outside and do things outside, um, right now going swimming outside. We do quite a bit right now with, with some of the teammates going hiking when we were able to, going skiing in the winter when we were able to, um, yeah, these kind of things just stay active in other ways which is also something interesting yeah. i think yeah. so you just actually touched on something interesting i remember about a decade ago there was an article in the globe about how wayne gretzky said he would put his hockey equipment down in april and he played the played baseball for the summer and then he'd go back to hockey there was none of this 12 months of the year playing hockey going to hockey camp so i'm curious as to whether this last 16 months has been a lesson in the importance of cross training and being a multifunctional athlete as opposed to being completely focused in, in training in one area. Um, I don't know if you've seen that with your uh, teammates, uh, Penny, Kellyanne, I'm just curious as to research and mindset in terms of maybe we've recalibrated a little bit. Is that possible? I, I don't know what the impacts are gonna be, but I do think a lot of people have got better in things that they never would have <laughs> even tried before. <laughs> and um, I think overall, I think being able to, to move functionally in different domains also in different um what would you call that like environments so for example ice or snow um i think it does help you in in some shape or form so i think we'll we'll see about that but i do think also that other point that penny was saying earlier is just like different identities and like seeing that there is a life behind or after basketball in my sense um which would be enjoyable and you could still stay active in other ways I think I think it'll be interesting to see. I think because you, Max, your examples of the of the the opportunities you took with groups of teammates to do different things, I I think it could play out pretty well when you get back to training. You still got to be careful, like Kelly said, of uh, or the team not coming back and training too hard too quick because of injuries. For sure, I think that is such an important piece. But if I I just want to follow up on your example. Deborah, when you asked Max of what he what he did and and a big part of what you just said or part of what you just said was, you know, you talked with each other and I we really like that that piece of social support of when you're feeling down or we're all frustrated by um, or in despair because things aren't happening and things are closed is having folks to talk to like that that uh, that social support piece. Of, of teammates, of partners, of family, of coaches really does help. I mean, it is the listening piece, right? Of listening and, and having the ability to, 
to vent and yell and scream if you need to, whatever, whatever that emotion is, is such a critical piece. And we do know that from the research and, and we've certainly seen it in, you know, there's been many studies on, you know, how COVID has affected people over this last year, people have jumped on that topic and rightly so. And so I think we're, it's a critical component. So one of the things we're thinking of doing in kinesiology this year is putting actually our students in groups of cohorts and, and students will be able to choose whether they want to take part, but it'll, it'll put them in, in groups led by, um, you know, a grad student or a fourth year well-trained student to just talk about whatever they want to talk about. There's no agenda, there's no, um, but just to give them some kind of support um, throughout this next year as we come back in whatever form we come back. So it's an experiment, we'll see how it works, but I'm pretty excited to, to try it for our undergrad students. And that'll be first years and fourth years like everybody yep. at the faculty. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's, uh, it's agnostic to where you are in your studies. Yep. Deborah, if so, I can just build on to what yeah, yeah, yeah. was um, one of the things that we did with teams were weekly challenges around um, activities, whether that was a nutrition piece when, from, from my perspective or other areas. And, and uh, that just you know, was a way to, to keep people engaged as well, just different weekly challenges. You know, just I just thought of something too, just in terms of you mentioned something earlier, people, you know, either having gained weight or, you know, not eating enough. I'm wondering if you're a little worried or have a, a hypersensitive lens out for the fad diets that some athletes may turn to in order to shed the weight so that they are performance ready or they're, you know, they're, they're at the weight where they need to be in order to compete. Are you starting to, are you concerned about that? Are you starting to see it? What are you looking for in your athletes? Right. So on, on that piece, Deborah, we'd be looking at um, what is someone's recovery like in terms of after their hard workouts, what are they incorporating nutritionally um, and just having an open dialogue around the full day of intake and, and looking for trends and exclusion of groups of foods and what does that represent? Certainly, um, you know, the pandemic has coincided with a movement towards vegetarianism. Yeah. yeah. That's really? so yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think they're two separate entities, but they're both been happening. Um, and, and what does that translate to in terms of uh, nutrients of concern? So another um, interesting outcome, too, I would say with the pandemic is way more home cooked meals. Right. People have been very creative and fam the whole family getting involved and a lot less beyond sourdough you're talking <laughs> i did sourdough <laughs> i did cinnamon buns <laughs> but you know more more family meals like when do we ever see family meals of uh, people actually sitting down and eating together it just was especially in the athletic world sure. uh, lots of families with yeah. young ones are active in the evenings with soccer and other sports that they're doing and families haven't been sitting down to eat and have that time together. And, and you mentioned it, Max, with Coach Dan and being around the family more so and, and made me think about that as well. But sorry, Deborah, getting off track. But yeah, yeah, no, yeah just curious always, as to whether you're, you know, always screening around. Well, why is in the back of my mind? Why is this person choosing not to eat this particular food? And, and, I'll, and I'll ask, you know, well, what's behind this? What's happening? And could be environmental, could be ethical, could be a texture, could be, uh, you know, a question. And I always get nervous when I see the perfect diet as well and someone that's eating 100% clean foods and, well, do they go off the rails on other days or is this sustainable? And, yeah. and uh, you know, really always looking for that moderation. And, and like you were saying, Max, you know, the balance and the trying different sports and the same with food. It's, it's the balance and the enjoyment and trying different things and, and not being so set in our ways and so structured. So the, the, this pandemic has given people a lot of freedom in, in many ways. So a um, question about uh, the potential that the return to sport might bring some challenges of its own where athletes aren't able to perform at the level they're used to because of the layoff or the performance slash experience doesn't meet their expectations that they've been living with in their own minds and away from their sport. How can we try to get ahead of that? I think that's a really good question because what is and what could be are 
not necessarily going to be the same, especially for the older athletes. <laughs> well, I, I think it is something that has to be considered. I, I think we'll see some athletes um, come back stronger and better and other athletes for whatever, a variety of different reasons weren't able to train or didn't put in some of the work and then we have to manage them. And I mean, that's always the challenge for a team coach to do that, right? He's got to, even though we're working towards one goal, he's got to treat each of those athletes or she has to treat each of those athletes individually to see where they're at. But I, yeah, I, it, I think it really is a bit unknown. Like, I think we will see some athletes do remarkably well um, and, and others, and others struggle. And we're going to have to manage both ends of that, that spectrum, I think. And everybody yeah. in the middle, like it'll be, yeah. yeah. Another research project. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, Max, when you talk to your your teammates, um, what have you been hearing from them in terms of how they're feeling about a return to competing and what their expectations are? Yeah, I think especially for our team, it's going to be a, quite the interesting one because we had mm -hmm. a relatively young team, but then um, would have kept the entire um, squad and really had some good chances of winning a national championship last year. And now with me and Brett being gone and they're coming in even more younger players, they are again, very, very young, um, have a lot of potential, but I think the expectations do have to shift a little bit from winning a national championship to going to U sports championships and getting some experiences. Um, so I do think it's just important to approach it in the, in the right manner. And then I think another, another thing is just, we don't have that much of a competitiveness right now in the schedule that we have laid out because we mm -hmm. play U of A, who are really good. Um, but then there's other two teams that normally are not so competitive and we can't play all of the other really good teams in U sports, which does make it a little bit harder. And I think when you don't compete at the highest level against teams, it's always hard to keep yourself at that high level. Sure. So I think... Uh, yeah. that that will be very interesting how that goes um how do you get yourself back in that competition mindset because that's that there's a racing mindset there's a competition mindset and if you're not doing it on a regular basis it's like a muscle it starts to get a little um uh you know it doesn't it's not as good to respond <laughs> You know what? That is such a critical question. Sorry, I'm just going to no, no, I'll yes, turn it to you, Max. Max, no, go, go. <laughs> no, you can go ahead, buddy. <laughs> I, well, I think that's what our Olympic athletes have seen as they've come back this season, um, you know, in March and April and May, depending on the sport and started competing. I mean, I think every year, a competitive season, you have to kind of relearn a little bit. But having missed a whole season, it's been a huge learning curve on how to you know, in, in track and field, how to go to that well, um, and race hard. Like it doesn't happen in the first race. You go, oh my God, mm -hmm. that was really hard. Cause it doesn't matter what you do in training. It's not the same as racing. And so it's been a learning curve for them. And I, I would expect it will be like, we don't, we don't forget how to compete, but there's a little bit that we sort of forget and then get back into that game mode. So that is such an important question. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was Go ahead, Max. And I, I, th I fully agree with that. I think it is like in, my, in our heads, like mentally, you are very much ready to compete and very excited to compete. But finding that edge to then put that on the court where you in every second actually go your hardest and getting those little things back in that normally make yeah. a team really good, that yeah. full competitiveness. Um, I think that, yeah, that, that'll take a bit. Yeah, it's, it's an exercise. It's a muscle. It's a different muscle that has to be exercised because it is the starting line or wherever you are or the jump ball or the face off, whatever it is, all of a sudden uh, it's a different system that you've drawn physiologically and psychologically. Kellyanne, do you have anything to add? Yeah, it's back to fundamentals and doing all those smart things that we know work around hydration, electrolytes, recovery, uh, okay, what's everyone doing on the pregame? What's happening on, like, it's back to basics yeah. and some education pieces, especially Max talks about the rookies and uh, teaching them how to cook, some of them, <laughs> living away from home, first time and 
grocery shopping, like fundamentals, I'm serious here. Those are the kinds of things, menu planning, brainstorming, how to cope with the life as a, as a student, especially uh, it, mm -hmm. it's you know a challenge around going to class all day, um, showing up to practice, energized and hydrated to be able to work hard for a, a good two hour stretch, right? So back to basics and lots of education on training diet and those optimal pieces. It seems to me it's all about controlling, do, controlling what you can in your own sphere. So it's things like it's your food and nutrition. What else can you add to that, Max or Penny? Like what are the known knowns that you can control so that you have fewer things that, you know, you're not so thrown off by the things that happen out of the blue, would you say? Max. Um, I think it's just creating habits. I think one of the, the biggest okay. ones is, is creating habits. And I think that's that's a big one that we always see on the court um, mm -hmm. is to, to get those things back in place um, where you don't just miss a box out, but you already like you defend and you end the possession with the box out. Those things that um, you do sometimes <clears throat> let slip away because they are the little things. Um, right. And I think really focusing on those will be critical. Well, and I think if you, if, I mean, what Kellyanne said about just getting all those basics and, and, and the strategies that you know in place, depending on the sport or the game, and then, and then you'll be able to manage the, oh, I forgot how to do that piece because there right. will be pieces. I mean, that's why we play preseason games, right? Is to get back into that mode of, of competing. And we've, we've missed a whole season of that. So mm -hmm. If you get all the basic stuff that you can think of, and I know the coaches will do this, and then, and then you get on the court and it's like, oh, I forgot how to do that. Oh, now I remember how to do it. And so, so you fix it. And then, you know, a bit of the difficulty is going to be the shorter season for sure mm -hmm. for most of our teams. Yep. So, you know, how is this all translating into research that we're doing at the University of Calgary in terms of uh, athlete resilience related to the pandemic? How is what we're seeing being applied to research that is being looked at or is already underway? Or is that just, are we one step? Is that question a little bit premature? Well, I think, I mean, I've just done in this last year, this, uh, you know, a couple of studies on, on, you know, that construct of psychological resilience and because it's been the perfect storm to, to study it. I mean, this is an unprecedented adversity. And so I've certainly taken advantage of that, but there's a few other folks across Canada that have done that as well from a psychological standpoint. I think, you know, the research that we're doing in, in, in the faculty, you know, in exercise physiology and in looking at biomechanics and the movement for athletes in, in all the injury prevention work we're doing and the neuromuscular training and warmups that will prevent a lot of injuries. And, and we're working to get the, that research, those findings, you know, translated for our varsity teams um, so that they can take advantage of, of that. Um, and as well for our athletes, you know, training in the Olympic Oval and their speed skaters. Right, and they haven't been able to skate till just now. So that's been another stress for them. That has been a huge stress, although they showed great resilience in training on lakes in, in whenever that was minus 30. And, you know, they had a good world championships, et cetera, that they got to go to. But it is really nice to have the oval back fully functioning with ice. That's that's the first time that's ever happened. But we do have a a 30 year old facility that was expected to last 25 years. So we've got some work to do for sure to raise dollars to replace the, uh, the ice plant. Yep. Yeah. But so, so nice to have it back functioning. So I want to just to touch back on uh, Max, just about your, some of the, your thesis work and how the importance of um, the exercise in uh, supporting patients that are undergoing cancer treatments, maybe in you know, how you had to transition to, making sure they had access to that, um, that program, but doing it online. I'm just curious if you could share some of those benefits from a sport and uh, wellness standpoint uh, for people who are undergoing treatment for cancer or other illnesses. 
Yeah, um, I think one of the big big takeaways that we saw is that the accessibility and the opportunities, opportunities that we do have in an online environment, because I think especially for people that are living rural or, for example, cancer survivors that are immunocompromised and don't want to come to potentially in-person classes where they may be exposed to certain pathogens, um, having that extra option to go online and we, show, we showed that it's pretty feasible to do and actually enjoyable for some participants because they don't have that extra stressor where they have to drive somewhere. Um, I do think that just opens up a little bit of an extra opportunity um, for people to be active. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what you said in a previous conversation is throughout the pandemic, some people became more active and others on the opposite side of the spectrum. Right. Um, but I do think we saw that there's more possibilities for us to to fight this other pandemic of obesity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're getting close to the end. I'm just wondering if each of you could sort of um, give us a sense of what you think the biggest takeaways are from the last 16 months from an athletics perspective and what you'll be you know, just, in, well, I guess, from a really health and well-being perspective, but just what you what you hope stays with us as we come out of this. and carry on and sort of start living the life we were hoping to live now that the restrictions are coming off. So I'm just curious, what do you hope sticks with all of us? So I'm going to start with Candy. I'll go to Kellyanne and then with Matt. Well, I guess I hope what sticks with us is that we, we are more resilient than we perhaps sometimes think we are. I, I think we've seen, even though I think it has been difficult for all of us in, in all the different roles we play, I think we've found ways to, um, to help athletes. Athletes have found ways to help each other. Um, the coaches have done a great job. Um, our faculty members have done a great job, even though some of them have been, they still haven't been able to get back to do their research. I hope that's coming soon with um, different kinds of populations, but I think we've shown we can be um, quite resilient. I hope there's other lessons that come out of managing a pandemic too, but I'll, I'll leave that for some politician as opposed to myself, but I think we're pretty resilient. And I think we know how to, um, to help each other. We just need to do that perhaps a bit better sometimes for different folks. Oh yeah. Deborah, I would say, um, you know, just learning to take time out for yourself. And when you're uh, behind a computer sitting all day, and it's important that we realize the, the mental health and the physiological breaks that we need for it to take and get up and get moving. And whether that means a little bit of structure around, okay, every hour do something, but um, that accountability piece of looking after ourselves. And, you know, the other thing with the pandemic is, the communication that we've had that, you know, connecting with people that we may not have connected with for a long time, at least a mm -hmm. many people in my world are reaching out and looking at different ways of, of, uh, of those communication channels. And that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's been good. And, and just appreciating each other and appreciate, wow, I, you know, things when we go back to the gym, really going to appreciate yeah. Yeah. <laughs> access to equipment and, yeah and just took things for granted before, right? Yeah, riding in a bunch of, ride, cycling with a whole bunch of people as opposed to being out on your own. Exactly. I'm pretty tired of my own playlist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, lessons learned from an athletics perspective from the, pro, the ACE program, um, what would you hope stays? Yeah, I, I would fully agree with Kelly and there on the last part that we did take certain things for granted. And um, mm -hmm. we now see how important really that in-person interaction is with each other and how, how we as humans, we need to be with each other and not constantly in front of our phones and on social media and all of these things. Um, I think we really started craving that. However, I think we also saw one of the key opportunities that... Um, all the technology that we have available may offer um, in a future world and how we can combine both and hopefully find the best out of both worlds, the in-person and then also the online. Well, I wanna thank all of you for a great discussion. I know that we could have gone on longer and it was, it was great to hear your, each of your perspectives. Um, as we get set to cheer on our favorite competitors and watch Canada competing in, in Tokyo, uh, 
whether you're a cycling fan, tennis, whatever it is that you want to watch the NBA finals, Stanley Cup, go Canada. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's just keep in mind that this has, this, that the pandemic has presented unique mental and physical challenges for all of us, including our athletes, wherever they are. And so more than ever, let's be inspired by their talent, determination, resilience, as we celebrate their return and their, and their incredible accomplishment. So thanks for being with us today. And for everybody else out there, if you enjoyed our conversation, I encourage you to visit ucalgary.ca forward slash community, where you'll find more webinars, podcasts, and stories on topics that matter to you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great summer. Cheer on our athletes, and we'll see you in September. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Deborah.